Are you annoyed by these diet zealots who say that their diet is the best one and whatever you're eating is wrong? I know, me too. But on one hand, it's great that they are emphasizing the importance of diet as on average, as a society, we don't place enough emphasis on it. But on the other hand, they take on this identity around it and they treat it like religion. Once you take on an identity, it's nearly impossible to view things objectively through a lens of reason because you identify with that idea. Any doubts about that idea, they now feel like a personal attack. Because of my own history with a gastrointestinal illness, I have spent countless hours sifting through the nutrition research, trying just about every diet out there, and this is what I've learned. When we try to look at things objectively, the first thing we do is look for what the science has to say about it. So what does the research say we should eat? The issue with that is that diet and nutrition research, it's kind of garbage. The first problem are the methodologies. A lot of nutritional studies rely on inaccurate methods like food questionnaires, where you ask participants to recall what they've eaten and in what quantity over a certain period of time. This is subject to recall bias, where there are substantial differences between what actually happened in reality and the accuracy or completeness as to what you actually recall. John, what are you eating? Nothing. You didn't eat anything? Yeah. Are you telling me the truth? Yeah. John, mm -hmm. you have sprinkles on your face. There have also been studies that show very few people are able to accurately recall what they've eaten even in the last 24 hours. Now, in addition to recall bias, there's self-report bias, which is also an issue. People have a tendency to respond to surveys and questionnaires in a way that makes them look as good as possible, meaning that they will tend to under-report behaviors that are perceived as bad and then over-report behaviors that are viewed as good. The second issue, confounding variables. There are so many factors that go into health that it's difficult to determine if the results were due to food or other factors, lifestyle behavior being the biggest one. And that brings us to the healthy user bias. People who tend to volunteer for nutritional studies, they tend to be people who care more about their health and diet. So they're often not a good representation of the general public. They might exercise more, they might avoid things that are harmful to their health, like drinking and smoking, etc. And these factors could actually be driving the difference that you see in the results more so than the actual diet. For instance, let's say you're doing a study on diet soda versus regular soda. The issue is now you have a confounding variable that people who tend to reach for diet soda might also be more health conscious and make other healthy choices. Diet soda might not be what's making the difference. Of course, that's assuming that you're not actually randomizing and assigning people to one study group versus the other. And number three is study design and funding. One of the best ways to minimize bias is to do a double blind randomized control trial where both the researchers and the participants don't know which group they're in, whether that's control or experimental. The first is that it's difficult to blind participants to the forms of whole foods or macronutrients that are gonna make up their study meals. And diet's also just a really integral part of our lives. It's hard to maintain a certain diet because a study told you to do so over extended periods. And with diet, you need that change to last for an extended period of time to actually see results, not just one day or one week. And the reason it's important to blind people is that if they know which group they're in, they may change their expectations or their behavior. And that's actually, this is where the placebo effect comes in. The other issue is funding. And there's very little incentive for companies to do good research on nutrition because a lot of the highly processed food that companies pay lots of money to advertise and create, they're not good for you. So why would they do research on these foods that aren't good for you? Think about it, who's actually gonna benefit from you learning that whole unprocessed foods from the grocery store or farmer's market are better than the latest formulation of protein powder or meal replacement shake. Part of the issue is diet is so individualized that just because a certain diet works for one person doesn't mean it's gonna work well for you. As an example, I did a ketogenic diet and I got wrecked in a bad way. And no, I don't just mean the keto flu. It's because of my inflammatory bowel disease I just couldn't handle the digestive burden of eating so much fat. And don't worry, I'll spare you the details. I also did a plant-based diet for four plus years. And at first I thought it was helping, but it wasn't reducing my meat consumption that helped. It was actually reducing my dairy intake that did it. So now I've reintroduced meat and just limit my dairy intake. And I feel better than I did back when I was plant-based. And the sad or maybe funny thing, depending on how you look at it, is when I made a YouTube video going over why I left a plant-based diet, a lot of vegans who had a very strong identity with their diet, they felt offended or enraged that I would go back to eating meat. But the thing is, the moment you identify with and get emotionally attached to your diet, that's the moment you lose objectivity and reason. And this is why I think it's so important to experiment with your diet and find one that works well for you. But I know, and I've, and I've been there, when you're first starting out, there's information overload. So much information, so much misinformation out there that 
dye is just difficult to navigate. And then in addition, it takes time for you to notice any significant difference after changing your diet. So a lot of people give up on their diet changes before it's even had a chance to have its effect. And that's where having ways to objectively measure how your body is responding to your diet is so important. And one tool that I've been using that I've been finding helpful is Lumen. Big thanks to Lumen for sponsoring this video. We often focus on the total number of calories, but you have to remember, not all calories are created equal. Our bodies handle different foods differently. And depending on what we eat, our body will switch between burning primarily carbs or primarily fats for fuel. And how we switch between these fuel sources, depending on what nutrients are available, is called metabolic flexibility. Now I've spoken about metabolic flexibility several times on this channel, and it's one of the main reasons why I do my three day water only fast like this one. Someone who has good metabolic flexibility will be able to easily switch from burning carbs to fats and vice versa, depending on what they're consuming and their energy state. Someone with poor metabolic flexibility will be unable to do so. This metabolic inflexibility is largely a consequence of impaired glucose uptake and is common amongst patients who are obese or have type 2 diabetes. The reason I care so much about metabolic flexibility is that there are tons of benefits to improving it, like prevention of metabolic disease, obesity, diabetes, things like that preventing blood sugar spikes, which is gonna to lead to a more consistent energy level throughout the day, easier weight loss, improved sleep, and better immune health. Lumen is the first handheld portable device that is able to accurately measure your metabolism at home. You simply breathe into the device and it will determine if you are primarily using carbs or fats for fuel. Based on your results, Lumen will give you personalized meal recommendations, real-time daily metabolic insights, and tailored eating plans personalized to your physiology. It teaches you about how your diet impacts your body and gives you guidance to keep you on track, which ultimately helps keep you accountable. To learn more about Lumen, check out the link in the description below. Part of the reason we don't have definitive research on nutrition is that it's difficult to study, but the other reason is that it's highly individualized based on your genetics, microbiome, and other factors. Now I've experimented with specific carbohydrate diet, ketogenic, gluten-free, plant-based, probably a few others. I've also tried dozens of different probiotics to see what's gonna help my gut feel its best. And this is why experimentation and objective testing and tracking with tools like Lumen or other devices is so important. But me telling you that diet is personal, it's not really helpful. So what are simple takeaways that you can implement in your own life? Although diet and nutrition are very personal things and the research has its limitations, if you look at things through an objective lens, there are a few common themes that come up repeatedly in the research. First is that whole unprocessed foods tend to be healthier. If it comes in a wrapper, it's probably processed. We know that these foods have fiber and micronutrients that processed foods usually don't. As much as science has advanced in the past several decades, we still don't fully understand all the components of whole foods and how they interact with our body. Whole unprocessed foods also help with the everything in moderation rule. If you eat an apple, yes, you're getting sugar, but it's a much smaller amount than if you had a cup of apple juice. Plus, the fiber in that apple is gonna help you feel more satiated, plus it slows down the absorption of carbohydrates. Let me give you another example. The leaves of the cocoa plant have been used for centuries by farmers in the Andes Mountains. They would chew them for a little bit of an energy boost, just like you and I might drink coffee or tea. But when you process it and refine it though, you get cocaine, and it becomes a much more potent stimulant to the point that it's dangerous. Now, I'm not calling processed foods the same as cocaine, but they're similar in that sometimes you get too much of something. And as we know, it's the dose that makes the poison. With whole and unprocessed foods, this is just less likely to occur. Number two is you need to have a diverse diet with lots of different foods. If you just eat chicken and broccoli every day, you're not getting the full spectrum of nutrients. Eating the same thing day in and day out is likely to deprive you of certain nutrients. And third, fermented foods are generally beneficial for our gut health. Although we usually think of bacteria as bad, they're actually very important for our health. They aid in digestion, they help with our immune system, and they make vitamins that we need but we can't make ourselves. If you wanna learn more about the gut microbiome, check out my video covering the biggest thing that modern medicine gets wrong. The key takeaway is this, diet is a personal thing. If you think your diet is the only thing that works, it might be for you, but what's right for someone else's body, preferences, and needs might be different. Everyone has different priorities. Some people prioritize ethical considerations when they're making their diet choices, and others just want to enjoy what they're eating. There's no right or wrong here. It depends on what you care about. My priority has always been health due to my underlying GI issues. If you're healthy, maybe you prioritize environmental or ethical ramifications of what you eat. Regardless, I urge you to experiment and not get too caught up with the identity of a certain diet or lifestyle. Use all of the tools and information available to you, like Lumen, to learn what works well for you and create the diet and lifestyle that is tailored to your own unique physiology and preferences. Thanks for watching, guys. Much love, and I'll see you in that next one.